Hello everybody and welcome to Linear Algebra Online. So today is the day where we finally get to start really doing some linear algebra, um, which is kind of crazy that it took like probably about a month until we got there, but um, we got there. So we're actually going to start to like actually write some matrices and stuff today, although you could actually argue that um, like a vector, like a 3D vector is like a three by one matrix, which actually I would, um, but we'll talk about that. Um, so I wanted to start with the real kind of basics here. So this is actually a slide from my Algebra 2 class, and I'm not going to go through all this. Um, all this work here, I feel like you should be able to do. This is just like solving a system of three equations. And um, the reason we're starting here is because on its simplest level, this is kind of what we're doing if, um, you know, we work with a three by four matrix. Um, we're basically just wondering, um, you know, what is the common point? In this case, it's eight, negative three, two, that is shared by all those, um, those three planes, right? And, you know, in Algebra 2, you learn this with, here I'm doing um, elimination, so I'm making this pair and this pair, and blah, 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 blah. Now, we're not going to really ever do that because it's not uh, efficient in any way. And also, uh, we're going to be working with things sometimes that are way bigger than this size. Um, just to show you another one, this is one where we would do it with, like, substitution. Um, I would do it substitution here because I can solve for the y really easily, right? And um, then I take that and I just plug it in. I don't need to teach you guys all this. Um, but um, the idea... Um, is definitely important to kind of keep straight what we're doing. That's what this is here to show you. So um, there's th sort of three cases if we have like a three by four system of solution, and that would be right here. And then there's three cases where you're going to get no solution, and that would be down here. Um, all we're doing, if we're in linear algebra, the things that we're working with are going to be straight, and I would put those in quotes if you saw me in person. Um, there can be straight lines, and then we're going to, um, you know, think of planes as sort of being nice straight things. Um, we could bump it up a dimension, and like R3, like, you know, space is straight uh, or flat. Um, there's no, like, curvature there, but... In that last problem, or that was last two problems, we basically saw this case, but you definitely could have a case where the planes are kind of all on top of each other like this, um, and then there would be infinitely many solutions, right? Um, infinite many solutions, so this is one solution. Sometimes students get kind of confused. Um, this case is it's not correct to say the answer is all like real numbers because there's tons of points you know i could do a point like a green point that's like up above um you know the plane like maybe there's like a vector or something out of the like a normal vector but wherever that ends that is not part of the solution um space so this is not the same thing as all real numbers sometimes students want to put all real numbers when they should really just say infinite solutions. There's totally different levels to infinity, and um, this is a, a smaller infinity than this one. Um, actually, same thing here, too. Uh, there's still infinite amount of solutions, um, but it's also true to still say that it's not all real numbers, right? I mean, you could take a point over in this green plane right here, and that's not a solution. It's only the things that share this common line of intersection. And then these don't work, right, just because there's no common point that all three share. Like, they share two in spots, but never all three. Um, so the point of this is, at its simplest kind of understanding, when we, like, solve matrix problems um, in linear algebra, even if our matrices start to get really big, this idea still applies. Like, we're basically just curious, do the things intersect? Or do they not intersect? Um, and we'll like do so much more about like understanding the theory behind um, what happens when they all share a point or not, or if you have infinite amount of solutions. But 
Um, you can understand linear algebra through this context of flat, kind of straight things like planes or lines or R3, um, w thinking about where they intersect, um, which is really what we're doing. Now, the reason we're never going to um, do anything by hand is because we're going to use this button a ton this year. Um, so I have steps here. Honestly, this is for my Algebra 2 class also. And we get to the point in Algebra 2 where we also are never solving like a system like this by hand. Um, I want them to use RREF in Algebra 2. I would want all of you for sure to know how to do this. I think most of you don't even use 84s, and that's good. I don't think you should at this point. Um, but if you want directions for 84, they're here. If you want directions for how to do RREF on like 89s or Inspires, I can do that too. I can like screencast my computer and show you on like an emulator how I do it. Um, Inspire is definitely the easiest because you can literally just type in R, R, E, F, and then do parentheses on the matrix, and it'll just do it. Um, if you do this one, just so we kind of um, are all on the same page here, if you R, R, E, F this one, you will get, um, I just had it up and I lost it. Okay, there it is. Uh, one, zero, zero, negative two, zero, one, zero, negative three, zero, zero, one, three. And the idea is like this bottom row tells me that Z is three, right? This one tells me Y is negative three. And last but not least, that one tells me X is negative two. Um, and that, that's really what we're gonna need. Like our problems are gonna be much more involved than solving a system. And you know, this point um, of intersection of these three planes is what we're actually going to be using to do all sorts of other stuff in our class. So you need to know how to do this fast. Um, and there's tons of examples online, like little walkthroughs on how to do it on various calculators. Um, if you don't know, you got to ask, because like right off the bat, we're going to start doing this all the time. So you might wonder what the RREF thing stands for, and that's a very good question. I don't even really tell my Algebra 2 students, and... I wouldn't really expect you guys to know, um, but after this, I would. Um, so REF stands for something called reduced row echelon form, but it's important to know what row echelon form is first. So um, I think it's almost easiest with uh, like examples to show you it, but um, the formal definition is this. So any rows consisting entirely of zeros are at the bottom, and then in each non-zero row, the first non-zero entry, called the leading entry, is in a column to the left of any leading entries below it. Okay? Great. So really, um, what you kind of need to see with these things is that there's going to be like a stair step pattern. Um, so the, the stair step pattern kind of comes out of numbered, uh, well, really both of them, I guess. Um, so... If you take a look at these uh, here, like this is definitely in row echelon form. There's no like um, entire zero row, but the second one says, the second condition says that in each non-zero row, the first non-zero entry is in a column to the left of the leading entries below it. So, you know, this is to the left of this, this is to the left of this. And so what you get is this, like, natural, like, stair-step pattern. Um, on this one, you don't get it because these um, really should be on the top. You, you have this negative 1 to the right of this, which means it's not in um, row echelon form. So that's not good. Um, I'm going to hold off on this, actually, for a second. <laughs> this one definitely doesn't fit because... Um, it actually would be good if that six wasn't there. If you got rid of the six, it'd be fine, because then you would get the like nice stair step thing. Um, but that six is there, so if the um, if the six is there, then we need to um, it's not in row echelon form. Um, this one is good. Um, we have like 
a zero row at the bottom, and we get that stair step thing. It's definitely in row echelon form. That one's good. Um, this one is also good. Um, you get the stair step thing, and um, you know, there's no non zero rows, but that's fine. It still has like that um, kind of diagonal down to the right um, effect that we should have. So the one I skipped, um, I want to say a little more about this definition always kind of bugged me because it doesn't really um, say that one of the most important things that the matrix needs to have had something called Gaussian elimination applied to it. So um, Gaussian elimination, I'm actually going to define here in a second, but all of these matrices here, like they've been basically reduced through different operations already. And those operations are part of the Gaussian elimination. Um, but this one hasn't been like reduced yet. We need to like, we would need to simplify this matrix before we know whether or not it's going to be in row echelon form. Um, and like when you simplify this one, you might end up getting like a zero here or something, a zero row. And then because it's at the top, it wouldn't be in row echelon form. But if you reduce it, you might also get this pattern. So um, row echelon form is, it, honestly, it's important, but um, the one that really I'm gonna talk more about is reduced row echelon form. That's like the RREF that you're doing here. Um, so, just know that like in order to check if it's in these forms you do have to do some kind of basic calculations first and i'll show you those in a second here but um but this one we wouldn't be able um, to say it's in rational form because this has not been applied to it yet so even in um row echelon form you can get a lot of information about the the problem so for example, in this one, um, this bottom part right here, right? This says like, you know, zero W plus zero X plus zero Y plus zero Z equals one. And that does not make sense. So you can already see um, just by looking at the bottom that there's no solution to that problem. Um, this one, it, um, you know, the bottom row is telling you that z is 5, right? And if z is 5, then we could, in a sense, back solve, right? And we could back solve, we can get like y from this uh, second row. And then we could back solve with x, no, ugh. we could back solve with y and z and get x. Um, but honestly, you could just reduce row echelon format and you would be able to pull out exactly what X, Y, and Z are. But there are times, there's like a few problems this year where actually if you take it all the way down to like RREF it, it's actually going to make it harder to see the answer rather than just doing REF. So you can do REF on your calculator too, not just RREF. Um, if you have the fancier calculators, you literally just type in like R E F parenthesis, and then you can put in your matrix. Um, this would be like, um, you know, you just type those in honestly and it'll work. So it's useful, um, for doing this kind of problem, like just solving a system out, it's probably never used. You would just do R R E F, but there are things this year where you should know what R E F is. So, what is Gaussian elimination? Um, so, Gaussian elimination is um, basically something where you've done elementary row operations. And elementary row operations are, to someone who um, grew up before the advent of calculators, this, these three words are like, torture, I would say. I was luckily did not grow up before that, but I knew a lot of my professors who definitely did, and they used to talk about it all the time. But um, I'll explain actually what I mean by the torture part later. But um, basically, there's three things you can do to a matrix. You can interchange rows in a matrix. You can flip rows around. Um, you can multiply a row by a non-zero constant. Um, so you can like scale a row up by two or chop it in half by two or something like that. 
And then you can add a multiple of a row to another row. Um, honestly, it's all we're doing when we do these Algebra 2 problems like this. Um, we're actually just doing elementary row operations, which I could teach the students that we call that Gaussian elimination, but um, there's no reason to really tell them that. So when <clears throat> once you've done this, and you get it into the row echelon form, that's called the Gaussian elimination. That you've done the Gaussian elimination. Um, Gauss-Jordan elimination takes it further. So Gauss-Jordan elimination, it, it, a reduced row echelon form matrix is one that has had Gauss-Jordan elimination applied to it. And these are two different famous mathematicians. But um, basically, um, the difference is um, it's in row echelon form, okay? So that needs to happen. And then the leading entry in each non-zero row is a one. And so you won't see things like a two ever here or a negative one or something. You have to have a one in front if they're, the first number in the row has to be a one. And then this is important too. Each column containing a one has zeros everywhere else. So you can see like this one has nothing but zeros everywhere else. This one has nothing but zeros. Um, I guess, yeah, this one too. So this one has nothing but zeros. Uh, when we do this problem, right, it actually fits that, right? It one, zero, zero, one, zero. Um, and it makes it really simple to get solutions like that. Um, so that's what the form is. And I just wanted to show you um, one example today of basically why people hated these back in the day. Because now you just go and you could take a huge matrix like this, a, what is this, one, two, three, four, five by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You could take a five by seven matrix on your calculator, do RREF, and you would just get this. Like a very specific matrix would get this, right? Um, Back in the day though, and I've seen these books, before calculators, you had to basically do all this stuff out and you were basically just keeping track of, you know, what you're doing to the rows, like maybe you're multiplying one row by something and then you get a new matrix and so on and so on. And I've seen these books where it's just pages and pages and pages of little, um, tables of matrices and they're showing like okay if i add row one and row three i get this new one and so on now the calculator just does it in two seconds um but it's kind of a um uh what's the word i'm looking for rite of passage to go through one of these with the elementary row operations um and so we're gonna do that, but just so you know, I will never do this again with you, and I would totally expect you to just go plug this into a matrix and do RREF. Um, the problems that we're gonna do require the conceptualization of what we're doing much more than the computation of what we're doing. Um, but it is kind of important to see one of these and kind of just put yourself in the shoes of people who were predating the advent of calendars and or calendars calculators and think about how hard um, some of this work was back then. So um, I'm going to start and just put this into a matrix and one, negative one, negative one, two, one, two, negative two, negative one, three, three, negative one, one, negative one, zero, negative three. Okay. And the way, um, there's some of this in the book too, so you can kind of see how some of these work. But um, one thing I might do off the bat, if I take row one and add it to row two, which is um, one of my, it's the third one here, it's one of my elementary row operations, um, that would help me start getting it into the form where I have like, um, you know, this reduced row echelon form with all these zeros sort of stacked in front. So I'm going to do that. Um, and the standard way to do this is to write um, like little R's. So R1, row 1, plus row 3. And then I would get 0, 0, negative 2, 2, negative 2. Um, doing nothing to row 2, so I'm just going to copy that. 
And then I did nothing to row three. So I'm gonna copy that. Then um, maybe I want to do row two plus two times row three, right? Because that would give me, um, I would basically kill some of this uh, part out. And so um, my OCD wants this to be red because Christmas. So um, doing nothing to the top, right? So I'm just gonna copy that. And then I would get zero, zero, negative three, three, negative three, negative one, one, negative one, zero, negative three. Again, because I did nothing to the bottom. So this is kind of nice now because if, like you can see because I have th these two zeros, these two zeros, um, then I have negative number, positive, negative, negative number, positive, negative. I can scale like, like these are scalars, right? Basically the idea is like these vectors are in line with each other. And so um, we'll get to this term later, but they're basically um, not linearly independent. So we can actually kill off a row here and get a row of zeros, which is gonna be nice. Um, so the way I would do that is I'm gonna do, let's just do row one uh, minus two thirds of row two. And yeah, that should do it. Um, so we have, if we do that, we're gonna kill off this first row. It's got all zeros now. Then I'll have zero, zero. I'm doing basically just copying the rest of it because um, I didn't do anything to it. So um, then I might also, I think I'm gonna do two things here. Um, so I'm gonna take negative a third of row two, just to make it like um, start with a one, which was part of the, um, the reduced row echelon form it needs to be starting with a one. And then I'm also going to do a, um, like a row swap, which is another elementary row operation. So I'm going to do row, um, actually I'm going to do negative row three swapped with um, row one, because I want that zero at the bottom. That's part of like the row echelon form. And I want this also to actually start with a one, so I'm gonna negate it when I flip it also, and negate everything in that um, row. So, that would mean I get one, negative one, one, zero, three. You can see how there are just so many ways to make silly mistakes, especially for someone like me who can't add and subtract, which is a bummer for a math teacher. Um, okay, so, that um, almost does it. The only thing we're missing is that this should be a, um, a zero to be in reduced row echelon form. So if I make that a zero, then I've done Gauss-Jordan elimination um, and uh, I'd be all set. So um, I'm gonna just simply do row one minus row two. That should do it. So if I do row one minus row two, I get one, negative one, zero, one, two, zero, zero, one, negative one, one, and then all zeros down there. Okay. <sighs> so this is just sort of a thing that um, I think you should see, but there are definitely like, I mean, there are so many books out there that were written before calculators were big. Um, where they just have these written for pages and pages and pages. You don't see it anymore because now you can just be like, RREF this, and it just jumps to that. But this is like the old school way of doing it. Um, and your book also kind of shows it to you. So if you want to see some more examples, they're in there for a little bit. But don't think we're doing this often because I don't want to do this every time. Um, I will definitely get some of them wrong too because it's all just arithmetic and I'm not good at that. Um, Okay, the one other thing I wanna say, so taking this um, matrix, if we write this out, it's saying W equals basically, so the, the equal sign is like here. Um, and so if I move everything, all the variables here over, I could say W equals two 
plus x minus z. And then the second row would say y equals 1 plus z. Okay. And I just wanted to talk about what this means for a second. So this is a four-dimensional plane, right? And there's th there, the four-dimensional plane is... Oh, like you're always going to embed those in a dimension um, up. So the, like you would have like 2D planes, right, in 3D space. If we have 4D plane, we're thinking of it in, um, typically, we're thinking of it in R5. Uh, or sorry, R, yeah, R5. And so this is three hyper planes in R5. And it totally makes sense. I hope it does to you too, that we would get infinitely many solutions, which is what this really is, because it would be like kind of equivalent to saying um, we, if we only think of two planes in R3, right? Um, if we just take two planes in R3, they're for sure going to have some sort of common line of intersection, which has infinite amount of solutions. And I can't draw this because I can't draw too well in higher dimensions. Um, but the idea is basically we have these three hyperplanes and they're embedded in a dimension where three are always going to intersect, just like two would always intersect um, unless they were parallel um, in, um, in uh, R3, right? And so we're getting infinite amount of solutions here. The, the answer isn't like a point the way it was over here. Um, it is some sort of, um, actually it's gonna end up being a plane and we'll talk about why I know that's a plane, but there's a plane of intersection between these hyperplanes um, that are um, embedded in a higher dimension. That's what happened here.